Flannery O'Connor at the Center of the Earth, a short story written by Marcus Lassard, narrated by Laura Johnson, Charles Johnson, and Timothy Burke. It's all darkness down there, Betsy said, her eyes swimming and squinting to get a better look inside the Colson family well, spiraling forever and anon into blackness. All I can see is a whole bunch of nothing. Whole bunch of nothing is right, Bud said, venturing a swift kick at the mortared circle of stone. Come on, it ain't no big deal. You lost your book. Just think. Now we can do actual fun things together, like Chasing frogs, squishing ants, watching Spongebob and Patrick Starr being best friends and pissing off Squidward tentacles instead of you just sitting around and reading all the time. Betsy's blonde hair fluttered. The folds in her overalls slackened as she jerked herself back onto her feet. She stepped away from the well's edge, swiped a sunburned hand over the clumps of grass staining her knees. I guess, she said softly. Betsy and Bud padded along the briary path, leading from their favorite hangout spot, over by the well, to the dilapidated house of dangling gutter and peeling white paint that Betsy and her dad called home. Dad, Betsy cried, the porch door swinging on its hinges behind her as she traipsed in. Guess what? Something kind of bad happened. Ron Colson thumbed the volume down on his remote control. Over here, in the living room. He yelled. I ain't getting up. Betsy and Bud made steps out of the kitchen and crossed the threshold into the living room. It was an accident, Betsy blurted. A good man. It fell down into our well. Ron sat up in his recliner. He reached over a stubby arm to set his beer down on the coffee table. A man fell into our well, he said, wide-eyed. No, the book you bought me. A good man is hard to find. Written by that old lady author, Flannery O'Connor. Ron relaxed back into the recliner and curved a smile. Flannery O'Connor was hardly an old lady, Betsy Bug. She died when she was only like 30-something. This was back in the 60s. Definitely old school, though, is what I think I'd meant when I told you that she was old-timey. And so what's this you say happened? The book! It fell down into the whale! Betsy's toe patted the well-worn and unvacuumed beige carpet. She cleared her throat. See, I was sitting on the whale's edge reading, and then... Bud came around, asking if I wanted to go frog catching in that brook over by the Dawson's old place. I was so, like, into that book that he surprised me when he said it, and the book slipped out of my hand and fell into the well. Ron smoothed his hands over the grease-stained tank top that reeled in his soft and sizable midsection as he mulled it over. Aw, oh, no biggie. He said, Just a book. Tag sale item. I'll buy you another. Daddy! Daddy! Betsy came bounding into the kitchen. I think we should try and save the book from the bottom of the well. Trying to save these eggs here from getting all broke and runny-like. First things first, pajama bottoms. Excuse me, Ron said as he sashayed over to the other side of the kitchen to grab his beer. He returned to the smoky frying pan on the stove. Hey, shouldn't you be getting dressed and ready for school? Ron took a swig of his beer. She wants out of the well. Ms. O'Connor does. She told me. Bud sniggered. Yeah, right. Next thing you'll say, there's a for real author lady down in your well. Or that Squidward Tentacles is your favorite cartoon character of all time. Ha ha ha. Bud. Ron said, yolk dripping from the spatula that he held in his hand. Don't you have a home of your own that you can go and eat breakfast at? 
Bud dug his spoon into his bowl of Lucky Charms. Mine, her new boyfriend, Floyd, said they wanted me out of the trailer. I said, ah, oh, come on, Ma. It's like five in the morning. Floyd said, trailer park's full of stray cats and drunk drivers. Go make friends with one of them. Scram. With milk dribbling down his chin, Bud moaned. Find a friend? That's the only friend I got. With his spatula, Ron pressed down on one of the slabs of Spam until it began to sizzle loudly. You've been coming over here quite a lot for breakfast, he said, an edge in his voice, as he pressed down harder with his spatula. Yesterday, two days ago, that time last week. Bud dropped his spoon into his bowl. Turning off the stove, Ron made steps for the table. What's all this you be saying, Betsy Bug? About someone saying something to you? Ron pulled up a chair. Betsy wiped the OJ off her chin and the smile clear off of her face. Miss O'Connor, she squirmed around in her seat. The rider lady. It was a dream that I had last night. She was at the bottom of the well, see? I couldn't see her face too good, but I knew that it was her. She said it was really dark down there. And if I didn't fetch her up soon, I might miss my chance at educating myself and going to a university. Girls. Bud rolled his eyes. Go figure. Ron winced. As if struck, he gulped. With a shake in his voice, he said, She said that? Those very words? Get you some educating. University? He shook his head. Well, I'll be. Yeah, huh? Betsy nodded. Bets, was a lady in the dream like all gross and decayed and waterlogged like in a monster movie? Bud flashed a toothy grin at Betsy. Betsy's eyes stayed on her father. So, can we try and fetch Miss O'Connor out of the whale, Dad, please? Ron snapped open a can of natural light. Taint the author lady herself that's down there, Betsy Bug. Just a copy of one of her books is all. Betsy poked at her eggs. Remember, Dad, she said, looking up finally. That sermon last Sunday? Remember how Pastor Dan preached about the prophet Samuel and how he got conjured up from the center of the earth by that witch lady? Bottom of our well's deep down enough to be at the center of the earth, right? If the lady in the Bible could find a way to get Samuel up to the surface, then couldn't we find a way to get the lady author up too? Ron chugged his beer, then set it down on the table. Pastor Dan's a good man, he said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. Knows the good book a whole lot better than you and I, Betsy Bug. If he says something's true, can be no doubting it. Can we try and get the book out then, please? Ron shifted around in his seat. Center of the earth's a million miles down or something. That's too far. Your lady author, I mean her book, would just have to make do down there, I'm reckoning. Betsy exclaimed. But she wants out. Book's probably all waterlogged by now, Bud offered. Wells have water in them, duh. Ron raised an eyebrow. Ours don't. He studied his toast as he slabbed country crock over both sides of it. Dry as a bone down there since 67. That well's been in this lousy family for three whole generations. Can you believe that, Betsy Bug? Your great-grandpa Hank? Ron explained as he licked the butter off of his knife. Ringed and mortared the last of those stones way back in the 20s. It was right before Hank died in that big bar fight with those Navy boys after saying some stuff to him he probably shouldn't have. Smiling, Bud offered. If we got a flashlight, we could find it. Ron shook his head. Flashlights don't fetch, buddy boy. They just flicker. Now. He spoke at his daughter. You put your school clothes on and run along. Or you'll miss your bus. Minutes later, Ron sat gazing at the squeaky porch door as it swung back and forth. 
Betsy and Bud, having just lightning bolted out of it, just in time to catch their bus. Ron scratched at the thinning hair on his head, his thoughts clamoring as they attempted to wrap themselves around a great many things. The next day, a tow truck sat motoring in the Colson's backyard. At Ron's cue, it began to roll in reverse, flattening the lush but tangled overgrowth of grass and briar that topped the soggy soil. With verbal directions given to the driver, such as, to the left, or over to the right, or look out, Ron guided the truck through the obstacle course that was the Colson's backyard. The truck weaved its way across rusty rototiller, an engine block, a 63 Ford set up on cement blocks, the sofa that the dog had whizzed on one too many times back in the mid-80s, beer cans, whiskey bottles, here and there piles of trash, an old refrigerator, dilapidated old toys. Daddy! Ron sipped at his beer. Hey there, Betsy Bug. He swiped the sweat off his brow. I've decided we's gonna get the old gal out. Betsy cheered. She jumped up and down. Ron set his sights back on the truck as it, beeping, inched its rear bumper up to the rim of the well. My pal Shane here. Ron pointed. Shane waved. Volunteered to do the job. For free, too. Seeing how I'm no longer working at the Piggly Wiggly and got shorted something awful on that last unemployment check. Ron cleared his throat. Shane agreed that your education's just too dang important. Pulley mechanism that Shane Jerry rigged on his truck should be able to fetch that book out. Ron winced as he looked into the distance, using his hand as a visor to shield the rays of the sun. And if you'd be wondering, Betsy Bug, we wouldn't normally need an entire truck to pull out a measly old book, but it's a brand new Silverado, and coming between a southern boy and his new truck ain't the wisest of things to do. Gonna let be and let Shane play with his new toy. I'm gonna go tell Bud, Betsy said and took off. He's watching TV in the living room. Ron called out after her. Hey, Betsy Bug, get you back over here for a sec. Betsy stopped in her tracks, walked back to her father. Say, don't you want to know what made your old dad change his mind? Betsy shrugged. Um, I don't know. I guess. Ron scoffed. She don't know. She guesses. Ron flashed the thumbs up sign to Shane over at the truck. This was Shane's cue to lower the rope and catch and begin the excavation with a flabby, pale arm and calloused hand. Ron guided Betsy over to the porch, sat her down on the porch swing. Ron plopped down alongside his daughter. Just want to tell you, he told her, chugging his beer, then patting her arm. There be three things in life that old dad never second guesses. Ron set his beer down. He cleared his throat. The good book a good buzz, and a dream that tells it like it is. You see, way back in the day, my mama... Grandma Rose? Yes, Grandma Rose, who wasn't my birth mama, mind you. One who'd lost both her feet from diabetes and eventually all her marbles, but Rose, my foster ma. See, Grandma Rose believed in dreams. Used to say that the good Lord knows how to plant seeds and sleep in heads. Smiling... Ron continued. One day, she had a dream, see? In the dream, she saw me patty-caking around with some blonde-haired girl. And guess what? Later that day, who should come moseying up these very steps but Miss Norma Lee Stetson, your own dear mother, selling Girl Scout cookies. It was love at first bite. A couple of times, stuff like that happened. And to this day, I too say that dreams mean something. Ron reached for his beer. Your pops ain't fancy for nothing, and rumor has it he's even gotten a drinking problem. Ron slurped at his beer. Still, he's got brains enough to reckon that there be unseen forces that shape the course of happenings in this crazy old world, sure enough. Betsy looked at her father with an intense gaze. 
Miss O'Connor said that if we didn't get her out, then I ain't ever gonna go to a university. Betsy softened her gaze a bit. Dad, am I gonna go to a university? I ain't very smart. Holy camoly. Ron slapped at his thigh. You ain't kidding. Ron lost his smile. That's why we gotta get you smart, by fetching you up that book. Ron set his fear aside. He sat pondering, his sights far off. My pops used to say that back in the day, Miss O'Connor was the wittiest gal around these parts. She grew up right here in downtown Savannah, some apartment just a few blocks up from Forsyth Park. Twas a religious lady, too, a good Catholic, so all the old-timers say. You can't get smart by Flannery O'Connor. You ain't gonna get smart by nobody. Betsy made the porch swing go higher and higher with little kicks of her legs. Did Grandpa go to a university? Ain't nobody in our family ever did. Ron sighed as he pulled a pack of camels out of their shirt pocket. Your granddaddy did a shit job fixing cars for a living. Couldn't stay sober. Then a Ford Thunderbird fell on him while he was doing repairs. Granddad was so dumb that he could throw himself on the ground and miss. Ron lit up a cigarette. Your Auntie Tess had a thing for kicking dogs. Went through five of them till finally we bought her a Doberman for Mother's Day. She left that one alone. Tess was what the old timers used to call frustrated. Ten slobbering brat kids will probably do that to anyone, I guess. Ron grew somber. Course you know about your own mama. He shook his head. Smoking and shooting up ain't no way to live. And then lose a life. She was lucky those first two times. Third overdose? Well, not so much. Ron looked over. No Colson's ever amounted to nothing. That's why we're gonna make sure you get to be somebody. You ain't gonna end up like your mama, you hear? Betsy nodded. We's a getting you that book. Dream said so, Miss O'Connor wants out. Wants you to get some educating too, from the sounds of it. Author lady's gonna have her wish. My wish too, Daddy, Betsy said. Ron puffed at his cigarette. Mine three. He stood. Well, glad we got that settled. Got it, Shane hollered from over by the well. Up she comes. Having to decide between sitting and getting drunk on the porch, or sitting and getting drunk on the recliner in the living room, was usually the biggest decision of Ron's day, and a major stressor. Finally, Ron decided that orangey sunsets and tolerable humidity levels presented a better option than Monday night reruns, and this was why. On this particular evening, he decided on the porch. Plus, sitting on the porch swing with a view of the well, backyard litter, oak trees draped all over in Spanish moss, grassy field, and Bud's trailer park in the distance, Ron could keep tabs on Betsy and Bud, who were growing up fast. Too fast. Ron said, reaching for the bug repellent. He generously sprayed both of his armpits, recalling his mama's advice back in the day that the stuff covered over foul odors as well as anything, and was a hell of a lot easier than showering. Where the heck's they at, anyway? Here they came, the gently sloped lay of the land, revealing only heads and shoulders at first. But as the youngsters chugged their way up from the marshy lowlands towards home, so, too, could swinging arms and running legs be seen, with one of those arms clutching a certain recently rescued book. Y'all get lost or something? Ron said as Betsy and Bud plodded up the porch steps all out of breath. Betsy said, panting, Bud and I went to check out that tall grassy area, or by the marsh. It's a really good place for reading and for sitting. She took a deep breath. Don't want you wandering off too far, you hear? Ron said as he lit up a cigarette. Bye, Dad. Betsy took steps toward the porch door. Hey, where are y'all going? 
Don't think old dad's forgotten it's report card day. Come on, give it here. Oh, yeah. Betsy thrummed through the pages of her book. Here it is. Then using it as a bookmark to mark the first page of Miss O'Connor's short story, A Stroke of Good Fortune. That story's my favorite. Betsy handed the report card to her father. Ron smiled as he took the report card. That one story really speaks to you, does it? Betsy looked warily at her father. No. Ah, uh, come on, Mr. Colson. Bud guffawed. Stop pulling Bet's leg. Books don't speak to people. Only people speak to people. Ron blinked. He took a drag from his cigarette. He said to Betsy, What I mean to say is, does the story really get your attention? Does it, like, have meaning for you way deep down inside of you? Well, yeah. Then it'd be speaking to you, sure enough. Ron turned the report card right side up. You getting yourself smarter reading that book? He said. Yes, Daddy. Brains are getting bigger, Bud offered. And so's the rest of her. Ron narrowed his eyes at the boy. Wasn't asking you, Bud. Ron reviewed the report card. A moment later, he handed the report card back to his daughter. Ron's expression was deadpan, as he said flatly. B grade in English? Tain't too bad. Tain't bad at all. Ron folded his hands. Improvement, I guess. I'm proud of you. I really, really am, Betsy Bug. Keep up the good work. Betsy snuggled the book with its mustard yellow cover up against her chest as if it were a child. Miss O'Connor's really been helping me out, hasn't she, Dad? Ron forced a smile. Boy, has she ever. I'm going to go upstairs and read some more. The third story in the collections, one that I've only read 22 and a quarter times. I'm really getting behind on that one. Betsy yanked open the porch door and pattered into the house. Bud followed along after her. Ron slapped at his neck. Damn mosquitoes. He cursed. Well, guess I need to be taking this little house party back into the house. He grabbed his beer. Recliner in range, Ron made a beeline for it, then plopped down. He groaned as he turned on the television. Groaned again as he reached to set his beer down on the coffee table. What's the matter, Mr. Colson? Bud said from his spot over at the kitchen table. Hemorrhoids? Bud. Ron said, flattering the boy with a look over. Please. Bud walked into the living room. Mr. Colson, a bee won't get her a scholarship, will it? To get an academic scholarship, she'd have to get, like, straight A's. Isn't that right? That's why you're all moaning and stuff, ain't it? Ron stared straight ahead at the TV screen. Can't you see that I'm watching Ice Road Truckers, son? Don't you have any frogs or snakes to go chase after? Nah, Betsy and me's getting kind of old for frog chasing. That was, like, so last week. We's all grown up now. Bud turned to face the television. That's what I'm going to be when I for real grow up, he said, pointing. A truck driver, just like my old man. Hey, do you think you could turn the volume up a little? Ron pressed the mute button. He flipped the channel. All grown up, he says. Ron grumbled in the direction of Fox News. Bud sat down on the ottoman. Yep, we's young adults now, Bets and me. Bud's smile stretched all the way to his ears. Why do I think this is not such a good thing? Ron said, grimacing. Bud folded his legs. Mr. Colson, can I ask you a question, man to man? Ron jostled around on the recliner. No. Bud picked at his nose. Well, see, I was going to ask Betsy if I could take her to the sixth grade spring dance. Would that be okay with you? Ron lowered the remote. He looked over. What am I? Your damned uncle? Go ahead. Ask her to the dance. Ron lolled his head against the headrest of the recliner. God knows y'all are going to end up dancing with each other sooner or later. Smirking. Bud reached for the open can of natural light on the coffee table. Ron leveled a stern gaze at the boy. 
Just kidding, Bud said, smile faltering as he withdrew his hand. Mr. Coulson, Bud said after a moment's deliberation, do you reckon Betsy will stay in touch with me after I go off to truck driving school and she goes off to... Bud shoulders slumped. Oh, yeah. If she doesn't get a scholarship, then she ain't going to college, is she? Ten thousand dollars a year, Bud. At the very least. That's what college tuition costs nowadays. You think I can afford that? Bud licked his lips upon which tempted a smile. A twinkle shone in his eyes. Just an idea, Mr. Coulson, but maybe if you got off your big lazy butt and worked some, like overtime hours or something, Ron was on his feet. I don't even work, period. And you know that, you little son of a... Ron calmed himself. Truck driver? Chuckling as he traipsed through the kitchen into the hallway, Bud bounded up the stairs to go see Betsy. You two be leaving that bedroom door open, you hear? Ron shouted at the ceiling. Ron's face fell into frown as the rest of them fell back onto the recliner. I know his type, he muttered. Gets her pregnant, and then leaves her with the kid while he scours truck stops for lot lizards, crack whores, whatever other female something he can lay his hands on. Won't pay his child support, neither. Ron down the last of his beer. He got up, ambled his way into the kitchen, the refrigerator. He needed another cold one. It was not often that the Colsons had visitors, especially well-dressed ones, at noon on a Sunday. The man was old, but well-maintained. His bow tie, button-down dress shirt, black leather shoes, and walking cane painted the very picture of refinement. Ron flipped off the Miss Georgia contest on the TV, took a big swig of Jack Daniels, then snuck the bottle under a sofa cushion and went to go answer the door. Through the screen of the porch door, Ron asked, Can I help you, mister? The old man smiled. I sure hope so. He looked at Ron. May I come in? Ron flitted a look over his shoulder at the dirty dishes, overflowing in the sink, empty beer cans on the table, grimy countertop, mouse droppings, and cockroach traps on the floor. Er, uh, maybe I can come out, instead of you coming in. We can talk on the porch. Very well. Stepping outside, the first thing that met Ron's senses, other than the Georgia heat embracing him, was the sound of giggles. His sights were met with flashes of color, the kids playing tag out in the field. Ron flicked a nod in their direction. That old there's my daughter, Betsy. She's the apple of my eye. Ron grimaced. And her little friend there, too. Look at him, running after her like chasing tails, the only thing he ever done did. Ron sighed. Kind of wish they was still chasing frogs instead of each other. The old man squinted the sun out of his eyes. I never had one of those. Kids, I mean. For such small creatures, they sure make a lot of noise, don't they? He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Your daughter, Mr. Coulson, is the very thing I've come to talk with you about. Ron gulped. Betsy? Really? Is she in some kind of trouble? She has a certain book, does she not? Ron didn't like the look in the old man's eyes as he said this word, book. Mayhap she do, mayhap she don't. Why do you ask? Oh, I think she has it all right. The old man smiled as with slow paces he graced the dusty floorboards of the porch. Savannah is a city that's seen civil wars and Forrest Gump, Mr. Colson. But it is a city not so very big, after all. Wood gets around these parts. The old man gripped his cane. You see... Looking over, he paused. Oh, but might we have a seat on your porch swing? These old legs here, you understand? Ron shrugged. He sat down beside the old man. Is this speech or whatever yours gonna be long? Ron said. See, there's this show I was wanting to watch. It will not be a lengthy rendering, I assure you. 
Ron furrowed his brow. A what? A few months back, the old man said, setting his cane aside. I had an estate sale. Oh, but I haven't introduced myself, have I? The old man extended a hand. Name's Jonathan J. Silverman, Jr. Pleased to meet you. And I know that you are Mr. Colson. Hell of a name. Ron snickered as she took the old man's hand. You rich and famous or something with a name like that? Ron wet his lips. Wait, haven't I heard that name before? Over the past four decades, I've owned and operated the Silverman Lumber Company. Big warehouse right off of Oglethorpe Ave. Yup, that's right, heard of you. You are rich then, and famous too, at least around these here parts. The old man smiled as he folded his hands over top his lap. Oh, but at my age, Mr. Colson, money tends not to mean so much. Things like health, good company, peace and quiet are the currency of old age. Silverman reached into his back pocket, removed his wallet. And that is why I have come to offer you, should you prove unwilling to accept a lesser offer, two hundred dollars for your daughter's book. That's a very special book, Mr. Colson. To me it is. Ron eyed the pair of hundred dollar bills held out at him. Book ain't for sale, he said curtly tearing his sights away from the money. Book and Betsy's been through a lot together. We even had it fetched up out of a well. Silverman withdrew his hand a little. Yes, I'd heard. Three hundred then. Silverman pulled another hundred out of his wallet. Ron sat impassive, looking straight ahead. Silverman's lip curled. Four hundred. Ron sighed. Silverman dug in his wallet. He held out five crisp bills. Sneering, he said in a loud voice, Five hundred dollars, Mr. Colson. Ron shook his head. Flapping the bills at Ron, Silverman exclaimed, She is a part of my past, Mr. Colson, a part of me, of my pedigree. He gritted his teeth. She speaks to me in my dreams, damn it. In fact, it was she who told me to— Silverman stopped himself. He pursed his lips. Shaking his head, he leaned back against the porch swing and sighed deeply. Ron sat upright. She speaks to you in your dreams? Silverman hung his head. My apologies for the cuss words. It's just that, well, your daughter's book means so very much to me. Ron furrowed his brow. Clearing his throat, he said, Means a lot to Betsy, too. His eyes discovering it impossible not to tempt another peek at the bills, he added, You see, originally, I'd bought that book for Betsy Bug, thinking that it'd get her to appreciate smart stuff, and so she'd want to get, like, you know, smart. And she is getting smarter. A mite, anyway. Ron leaned back on the porch swing. Anyway, little did I realize how attached she's got to that book. Carries it with her everywhere she goes. Read every story in there maybe fifty times over. Betsy Bug would never, ever part with that book, and I ain't about to. Mr. Colson, surely you are a reasonable man. Silverman allowed his sights to wander. He could put this money toward some home improvement project, say. Install a flowery trellis, a renaissance-style fountain over here. Put in a nice Japanese garden over yonder there. Ron belched. Ain't no garden would ever want to have anything to do with this place. He shifted around on the wood seat. His eyes widened in appeal. That book's her ticket to a better life, Mr. Silverman Lumber. Her ticket to smartness, to college, it's her ticket out of this place. Feeling deep down inside of him, his angry, drunk side, stir around like a pregnancy. Ron donned his happy face as he quickly changed the subject. So, you're the one that I'd bought that book from at that tag sale. 
Who'd have known? The Silverman lumber guy himself. Silverman leaned back. No doubt. It was my associate you'd bought it from. I was busy at the time trying to sell off the mansion, and so I wasn't around to give the specific instruction to under no circumstance sell that book. Silverman, rock the chair a little. No heir to pass along the company to, and so I had to sell that off as well. Big, empty, lonely old warehouse now. As for myself, I've relocated to the hospice, loaded and lonely as heck. Silverman stopped rocking. He looked at Ron. That book holds great sentimental value for me, Mr. Colson. I have a special connection to the author of that book. Flan O'Connor and I were childhood friends, and later on we were high school sweethearts. Flan grew right up here in Savannah, if you didn't know. Everyone knows that, Ron said. He scratched at the stubble on his chin. Well, I'll be darned. Sweethearts. He sighted a glance at the kids playing by the well. Mr. Silverman, he said, if you don't mind indulging a curiosity that I got, I was wondering if, er, uh, over the time y'all were growing up, did you and your author friend ever engage in the old, <laughs> the old Jack and Diane? Silverman grinned. Ah, Mr. Colson. You are a southern gentleman of the rarest sort, a true master of the arts of subtlety, gentle reference, and solicitude. Ron blinked repeatedly. Sounds about right. He said. Whatever, uh, t'was you just said right there. The answer to your question is no. No? Really? Well, to be frank, Mr. Colson, Flan and I were far too occupied in what would turn out to be our future career paths to engage in the usual high school antics, fooling around and such. Ron lowered his chin into his hand. Hmm, so getting focused and all successful like is what keeps young folks from having a whole bunch of kids they can't take care of? Silverman smirked. I suppose you could say that. It did for Flan and I. Ron crossed his arms. Then that book ain't for sale. At any price. That book might just be enough to give my Betsy some bud protection. Bud? Protection? That little devil over there. Ron turned and pointed. See him? Waving that branch around like he was Darth Vader or something? Silverman curved a smile. Oh, but Mr. Colson, I was quite the little devil too at that age. His dress shirt lost its creases as the old man straightened. But of course, I grew up. Have to in the lumber business, actually. Silverman pursed his lips in concentration. One might even say that it was Flan who helped me to grow up and get right. You see, it was in seeing her dedication, determination, and devotion to her craft that I finally decided that I, too, wanted to be dedicated, devoted, and determined in something. I stopped all of the tomcatting around, flirting, fussing, hustling, road raging, and got busy, well, you know, selling two-by-fours and plywood sheets. Miss O'Connor did that? Help you grow up and become all responsible-like? Silverman reached for his cane. You'd be surprised how much the behavior of others around us can influence our own behaviors. Just as bad habits can be contagious, so too can good ones. Cain clenched between his bony knees, Silverman said. Now listen, there's more. And look here, your swimsuit models on the TV can wait. You may not rush off on me. I want you to hear me out. Ron's cheeks took on a blush of crimson. His sheepish smile made known that he was not going anywhere. Silverman folded one leg over top the other. Flan and I had gone our separate ways after high school. She off to the Georgia State College for Women, and I to carry on my father's lumber business. It wasn't until two decades later that we would get back together again. That was when she handed me this first edition copy of her short story collection, A Good Man is Hard to Find. Strange title, eh? 
She told me the inspiration behind that title was a certain... Silverman curved a smile. Best friend she had known back in high school. She never told anyone else. It was our little secret. Now, as for the book itself, her very heart and soul was imprinted into it. Believe me, I knew her well. That book is Flannery O'Connor as much as the woman herself ever was. Silverman's smile faded. Flan died not too long after that. From lupus. Awful, awful like you cannot even begin to imagine, Mr. Coulson, that disease is. Silverman allowed himself a moment. Finally, he continued. Looking back, I still believe that things could have worked out between us. Indeed, they would have had she lived longer. Flynn never married, nor did I. Couldn't bring myself to. No woman ever had the grace, wit, and individuality as did Miss Flannery O'Connor. Silverman held Ron's studied gaze. Your daughter's book, Mr. Coulson, is, you see, the fulfillment of a kind of promise that I made to Miss O'Connor on that day long ago. The promise that I would forever keep her in my heart by keeping that book of hers forever by my side. Having it with me is like having her with me. It speaks to me. She speaks to me. Not so much a book as it is a memorial. More than that, a veritable presence. It is Flan herself, living and breathing, resurrected, brought to life by the timelessness of both the words that she wrote and the words that she'd spoken to me that one day. It is... Daddy? A voice said with wide eyes. Silverman turned. Ron looked over and smiled. It was Betsy. The in question mustard colored volume clasped in her folded arms. Daddy, why does this man want my book? Silverman made a low, strangled noise. Ron exhaled long and slow. Sweetie, he said, listen to me. Gotta tell you something. With all due respect to Mr. Silverman here, who's good peoples and's got a fine and interesting story, I've decided, and it's my final decision, no one is ever going to take that book away from... No, Betsy said with soft steps over to the porch swing. Here, she placed the book on Silverman's lap. I don't need it anymore. It spoke to me. I got it. I got the message. Betsy turned to her father. Her face reddened, eyes shimmered, brow twitched, as she tried in vain to fight back the tears, even as one began to trickle down her cheek. Ron cocked his head. What's the matter, honey? Betsy sniffled. I'm no good, she said. I can't do anything right. I'm a Failure. Betsy hung her head. I know it. It's for sure now. Bud just told me that I'll never go to college because I ain't ever going to be able to get a scholarship. I tried and failed. I failed her. I failed Miss O'Connor. Betsy wiped her wet cheek on the back of her hand. I can't do it. I'll never be able to get A grades. I'm too... Shuddering, Betsy clenched her teeth. Dumb! And with that, the tears came full on. Oh, come on. Stop your hissy fitting. Ron chided. You're all grown up now, remember? And you ain't that dumb. Through her sobs, Betsy struggled to force the words out. And my... She sputtered. In that dream I had about Mrs. O'Connor, when she told me, when she said that... Silverman stood. You had a dream, child? He said. About Ms. O'Connor? You saw her? She spoke to you? Silverman turned and said to Ron. I hadn't heard that part of the story. Upon this sudden reminder that guests were present, and fancy-looking ones at that, and the realization that she was probably acting like the child that she no longer was, Betsy tried to pull herself together. She sniffled back her nasal secretions, wiped her eyes. She was at the bottom of our well, Ms. O'Connor was. 
She said that if I didn't fetch her out, then I wouldn't get the chance to go to a university to get an education. I failed her, though. Now I'll never go to a university. Will I, Daddy? Will I? Ron dabbed at the moisture collecting in the corner of his own eye. Oh, hell, he said, sniffling, continuing to rub at his eyes. Got me a gnat or something in my eye here. Sorry. Ron took a deep breath. Your book, Mr. Silverman, he said. See, it had fallen down into our well. Ron pointed at the well. A friend of mine who works over at Snow Code down the road helped us fetch it. I mean her. I mean it out. That book, like Betsy told you, spoke to her in that dream she'd had. But it's been speaking to her ever since, encouraging her to get right by getting an education. Sighing, Ron said. Never before, Mr. Silverman, have I seen a dead author lady and her book speaking to someone like Miss O'Connor's been speaking to my Betsy here. Betsy Bug's not only convinced that she needs to get herself right, she's full-on passionate about it. Ron swallowed. Bottom line, I can't ever afford a college education for Betsy. Reading that book is making her smarter, but just not smart enough to get her a scholarship. Silverman breathed heavily. Why didn't you tell me? He exclaimed. He turned on his heels slowly to face the girl. Standing stock still, he stared at her with a widening of his eyes. That was to suggest that the youngster might be something from another world. Silverman wet his lips. You saved her then, didn't you, my dear? He touched the rubber tip of his cane against the floorboards. You rescued Ms. O'Connor from that dark, lonely place where she was being held prisoner, as it were. You responded to Flan's cries for help. You helped out a good, dear old friend of mine. With chin in hand and with slow, measured paces, Silverman traced a path back and forth across the creaky floorboards as he thought it over. He stopped. He looked at Ron, then at Betsy. Raising an eyebrow, he said to her, And that is why I am going to help you. With a string of impassioned sighs, Ron Colson lowered his beer bottle onto the dusty floorboards of the porch. He stopped the back-and-forth oscillations of the porch swing. He pulled out of his shirt pocket a ballpoint pen and a wire notepad. Setting pen to paper, he began to write. Dear Diary, God, how I hate writing this crap. Want to write this all down, though so that Betsy Bug and her future youngins can see just how far Betsy come along, and so they can take some sort of lesson from it or something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm keeping a diary. It's all Betsy Bug's fault. Wonderful world of words, or whatever it is, as she called it. She kept encouraging me to. Well, it's been six months since my last entry. That was when Betsy first started school at the University of Georgia. English major with a minor in education. All expenses paid, courtesy of your good friend Mr. Jonathan J. Silverman Jr. of Silverman Lumber Company. Betsy never did get those high enough grades in high school that was supposed to qualify her for a scholarship, but it ended up not mattering. Betsy Bug tells me she wants to become a teacher so that she can share with young people the world over about the wonderful world of words. Or whatever that thing was she'd said. Betsy says that weekends on campus are all lonely-like. And so that's why she drives down here to Savannah to come visit me and Mr. Silverman at the Shady Oaks place over on 52nd. And Bud at the truck maintenance center he owns and operates inside of that big warehouse right off of Oglethorpe Avenue. Silverman called earlier this week. Said that the first edition copy of A Good Man is hard to find is something he's going to bequeath. I think that's how it's spelled. In his will to Betsy. Silverman says that he keeps the book by his bedside at the hospice. He says that it speaks to him. Speaking of, have me another one of those dreams last night. This time, she didn't say anything. 
She just sort of waved and smiled, as if to say thank you to me. I tried to say thank you back, but the words just wouldn't come out. The smile that dimpled her cheeks and the light that shone in her eyes said you're welcome, about as well as the words themselves ever could have though I'm thinking. Not too bad looking either, that author lady, with that light brown hair of hers all fluttering in the shady shadows like it done did. Who'd have knew that things like dreams could be contagious? Mama, God rest her soul, was right when she said to take those kind of things seriously. Well, that's all for now. Gotta get dressed and ready for work. Truck maintenance is a hell of a good gig. And word around the plant is that Big Boss Bud, as he's referred to now, really likes the work that I do. And that he's looking forward to calling me dad. Whole lot of fussing on his part. But with the encouragement of Betsy Bug and the help of Mr. Silverman, that boy finally did get his apples all in a row, and in a big way. Betsy Bug drew a hard line of no spring dance, no junior prom, no senior prom, no chasing, no wild thinging. And the boy, I guess, just wasn't ready to lose his best and only friend for the sake of shenanigans. I'm reckoning that things will work out between him and Betsy. Everything has so far, and who'd have thought that it was all because of some author lady who was appearing in all of our dreams, and who we decided to pull out of the center of the earth.